on infractions press call. At this time, all participants are in listen-only mode. Later, we will conduct a question and answer session, and instructions will be given at that time. If you should require assistance during the call, please press star followed by the zero. As a reminder, today's conference is being recorded, and I would now like to turn the conference over to our first speaker, Ms. Emily James. Please go ahead. Good afternoon. Welcome to today's press call to discuss the NCAA Division I Committee on Infractions decision regarding the University of Louisville. As members of the media, you should have received a link to both the press release and the public decision, which contains the details of this case. The information can also be found at ncaa.org. The Committee on Infractions is an independent group comprised of representatives across the NCAA membership and the public. The members who reviewed this case on the panel are William Black III, an attorney in private practice, Carol Cartwright, Chief Hearing Officer for the panel, President Emeritus at Kent State and Bowling Green, Greg Christopher, Athletics Director at Xavier, Thomas Hill, Senior Policy Advisor to the President of Ohio, Iowa State, Stephen Madva, Attorney in Private Practice, Joseph Novak, former head football coach at Northern Illinois, and Larry Parkinson, Director of Enforcement for the Federal en Energy Regulatory Commission. Carol Cartwright will now discuss the findings and the decisions of the infractions panel. Following her open, opening comments, she will take questions. Thank you. The Committee on Infractions decision details the findings and penalties in this case. Our comments today are designed to address your questions. However, the report stands on its own merit. I will start by noting that I don't believe the Committee on Infractions has ever encountered a case like this. The violations in this case centered on a former director of men's basketball operations arranging for striptease dances and sex acts for prospects, student athletes, and others. We found he violated ethical conduct rules when he committed these serious, repugnant violations and when he did not cooperate with the investigation. We also found that the head men's basketball coach did not meet NCAA head coach responsibility rules when he failed to monitor the activities of the former operations director. During his time at the university, the former operations director was integral to on-campus recruiting and regularly interacted with visiting prospects. The head coach hired him and placed him in Minardi Hall, which was essentially a basketball dorm, to make sure it was run properly and watch for any potential NCAA violations. By his own admission, the head coach and his assistants did not interact with prospects from 10 p.m. until the next morning. The head coach essentially placed a peer of the student athletes in a position of authority over the prospects and assumed that all behave appropriately. This arrangement played a role in creating a location where the former director's activities went undetected. In total, the activities were arranged for 15 prospects, three enrolled student athletes, and a friend visiting with one of the prospects, and two non-scholastic coaches. At least seven, and as many as 10 of the 15 prospects were under the age of 18 at the time. We found that none of the prospects visiting campus knew that the activities would occur, and none of them expected the activities to occur on their visits. Some of them even expressed surprise and discomfort at what transpired during the investigation. These violations were severe and provided a substantial recruiting advantage to the university. Without dispute, the rules do not allow institutional staff members to arrange for stripteases and sex acts for prospects, enrolled student athletes, and or those who accompany them to campus. NCAA members also agree that schools must provide a safe, healthy, and positive environment for their student athletes, not only academically, but in all facets of their lives. The former operations director was required by those rules to act with honor and dignity, but he instead created an environment that has no place on a college campus and was directly at odds with college athletics and higher education. The head coach failed to monitor the former operations director 
when he created the residential environment in which the violations occurred and when he trusted his former operations director to do the right thing. He delegated monitoring the former operations director to his assistant coaches. The assistant coaches said they were unaware of that responsibility when asked during the investigation. A head coach does not meet his monitoring responsibility by simply trusting an individual to know NCAA rules and to do the right thing. A former program assistant also failed to fully cooperate in the investigation when he refused to provide requested phone records to the enforcement staff. The records in question were relevant to the investigation and could have helped determine if the former assistant was involved in an incident after the former operations director took a new job at a different school. Because these violations occurred both before and after the new infractions process, we compared the previous penalty structure to the current structure to determine which is more lenient, as outlined in the rule change. After reviewing, we determined the previous structure was more lenient. I will now review the penalties we prescribed. The public decision contains more detail. The university will be on probation for four years. The head coach will be suspended from the first five Atlantic Coast Conference games of the 2017-18 season for the head coach. The former operations director was prescribed a 10-year show cause period. The former program assistant was prescribed a one-year show cause order. The university must vacate records in which student athletes competed while ineligible. I will not be identifying the games impacted during our call today. The university will identify the games impacted now that they have received the decision. The university self-imposed a reduction in men's basketball scholarships by two during the 2016-17 year. We also prescribed an additional four scholarship reduction over the probation period. The university may take the reductions during any year of that period. We accepted recruiting restrictions self-imposed by the university. Those are detailed in the public report. Additionally, men's basketball prospects on unofficial visits may not stay overnight in any campus dorm or school-owned property during the probation period. In addition to a $5,000 fine self-imposed by the university, it must also return to the NCAA the money received through conference revenue sharing for its appearances in the 2012, 2013, 2014, and 2015 NCAA men's basketball tournament. Future revenue distributions that are scheduled to be provided to the university from those tournaments must also be withheld by the conference and forfeited to the NCAA. We also accepted the self-imposed men's basketball team's postseason ban for the 2015-16 season. This concludes my opening remarks. Thanks, Carol. Brad, can you please explain how reporters can ask a question? Of course. And if there are any questions from the phone lines at this time, please press star followed by the one on your touchstone phone. You'll hear a tone indicating you've been placed in queue. Once again, if there are any questions from the phone lines, please press star followed by the one at this time. And one moment, please, for our first question. We do have a question from the line of Pat Ford with Yahoo Sports. Please go ahead. Yes, ma'am. Hi. I'm just wondering uh, why the uh, impacted games uh, involving ineligible athletes will not be identified given the potential for impacting the 2013 National Championship. It's the NCAA's process to uh, go through the analysis uh, after the decision is released so that the institution and the NCAA will determine those. It's standard process. And we do have a question from the line of Nicole Auerbach with USA Today. Please go ahead. Yes, I was wondering um, why, uh, re reading through the old penalty structure and the new penalty structure, um, I'm just curious why parts were applied of each and why the uh, committee went with the more lenient penalty structure? Oh, it's our process that when violations occur 
both before and after the new structure, uh, we do the analysis. In this case, the violations were about evenly distributed between the old and the new. And it's our standard process in those cases uh, to use the more lenient process. And that's what we did in this case. And we do have a question from the line of Jeff Greer with The Courier. Please go ahead. There is a, a lot of discussion about, uh, in the media at least, about um, the number of, in, of impermissible inducement in terms of monetary value. How much did that factor into it versus just the, the obvious shock value of, of the allegations and, and the findings from, from everything? It's our position that... Um, Prospects and student athletes uh, deserve uh, an appropriate environment, a healthy, safe environment. Uh, in this case, we felt that any of the acts uh, on their own would be level one and would be inappropriate. Uh, so we were not persuaded by the argument that the monetary amounts were small and therefore uh, the violations shouldn't have been seen as, as this severe. We felt any one of them standing on its own uh, was level one, and we described that more completely in our report. I think you can go to the report and, and find the explanation. And we do have a question from the line of John Barr with ESPN. Please go ahead. I'm curious what role, if any, of the per perceived lack of contrition from Louisville may have played in your decision? The panel based its decision on the facts in the case, did not make assumptions. And we do have a question from the line of Eric Crawford with WDRB. Please go ahead. I'm not hearing a question. There's a garbled. Sir, if you're on a speakerphone, please pick up your handset uh, or repeat your question. They were unable to hear you. Our apologies. We'll be moving on to the next question. So, Michael DeCorey with Sporting News, please go ahead. Yes, can you explain what about the process, how, how, how active athletes were, were ruled ineligible as a result of this? Uh, was it an extra benefits concept? I mean, since, like you said, it is unprecedented, uh, what, what would have rendered those three athletes ineligible? You're, you're correct um, that at, in a technical sense, it, it is a, uh, an impermissible benefit. And we do have a question from the line of Chris Carlson with Syracuse Press. Please go ahead. Uh, Carol, the last uh, couple times we've seen the, the head coach accountability rule um, used, it, it's resulted in a nine-game suspension. Um, is there any reason why uh, you guys opted for five games in this case? We do describe in our report uh, the reasoning for this particular penalty, and I would just remind everyone that the, the facts and circumstances of each case are different, and this, this report stands on its own merit. And we do have a question from the line of Josh Ablove with WLKY TV. Please go ahead. Uh, given the time frame for the vacated wins, does the NCAA have any intention to require the university to remove banners for the 2012 Final Four and the 2013 National Championship? There's a process that the NCAA uses uh, that you can get more information about from Emily James or her staff. Uh, it describes fully what happens when wins are vacated, what else has to happen. And it's quite a thorough description, so you can get that from her. And we do have a question from the line of Dave Baker with WYK TV. Please go ahead. Hey there. Uh, uh, 
Again, I'm not hearing a question. One moment. Just a question about the process. You talked about the analysis. Do you and the school now go through a process where you take a look at which games should be vacated because of player participation, or do you currently know that and the school is just responsible for releasing them? I'm just trying to understand that aspect of it. It's, it's a process that the NCAA goes through with the school uh, to determine um, games in which ineligible players competed. All right, seeing no other questions on the line, thank you for joining us today. This concludes our comments. A recording of the teleconference will be available in the near future on NCA.org. And ladies and gentlemen, that does conclude your conference for today. Thank you for your participation and for using the AT&T Executive Teleconference Service. You may